you're going to see me in a different light today. I'm doing something out of my comfort zone, which is not up here acting silly like I really like to do. Um, if you see my neck turning red, it's because I'm really nervous, actually. Uh, is it? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, today is Mother's Day. And already I've heard, you know, lots of hugs and kisses and, you know, it's a, it's a good feeling day for mothers. Well, I'm going to mess that up. <laughs> Not exactly. Um, I'm going to tell you something that I put together probably about five years ago. And I did this because I was tired of seeing women treat their husbands like trash, basically. And I see this a lot. <laughs> the men are saying, yeah, man, yeah, <laughs> this is about us today. Um, the, <laughs> not really. Um, maybe it will help you guys, though. Um, Ralph, every Father's Day, he gets up here, and he beats you men up. Boy, I, I hear it every time. Man, he beat me up. Oh, man, 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 you know. Well, today it's the Women's Day. I get to beat up on you guys because I'm a woman. Been there, done that, a lot of things. Um, what this is about, ladies, it is very important for you to understand how effective, how effectively you should be in being the helpmate, your husband's helpmate in some of these areas. His inability to have patience, caring for the household, his physical and emotional needs, irritability, he's tired. How can a wife help rather than compound the problem? I don't know if any of you women have those things happen in your household. I did and still do to some degree. Um, do we all understand, ladies, what the term helpmate means? And I want you to really think about um, your role as a wife and the woman in the, in the home. Um, one of my God-given roles as a wife is being a helpmate to my husband. The Lord God said it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a suitable helper, which is us. God said this, okay? Um, I'm sure most of you have already heard how much love that Ralph and I have for each other. I get used to, I get used almost every Sunday in his sermons. Ralph and I have been married almost 30 years. 38. Or, sorry, my paper says 38. I just said 30. I wanted to go back in time. Um, anyway. I was been, better back then. <laughs> um, we've been married almost 38 years. Um, and it just keeps getting gooder and gooder. I wonder how many of you could say that. I came up here to just say a few words that might help some of you women when you're at your wit's end with trying to understand your husband and to be his helpmate. As you all know, my husband's not perfect. Me, <clears throat> on the other hand, hmm. I fell in love with my husband in the beginning. Then it went to a strong like. And then it went to what, has, what in the world's happened to me now? What has happened? It took many tears, lots of prayer from myself and Ralph's mom and dad to get me through the hard times. Believe me, there were plenty. But you know, once I made my mind up to let the Lord lead me and give it up to him, I could then proceed with a plan of action. Before I knew anything about the term helpmate, nobody was teaching us about helpmates, how we were supposed to be a wife to our husbands. I, and before, okay, before I knew anything about the term helpmate, I decided divorce was not an option, even if it was the easy way out. I put my big girl pants on and I started watching and learning my husband. And I had to put myself on the back burner. I don't know how many of you women have had to do that. 
but it is something that we have to do from time to time. It's not all about us all the time, I'm telling you. Um, I thought at that time that it should have been all about me and my son, but my husband had a very explosive temper at times, and it would scare me. I couldn't fight him with words because he's so good with that, as you guys know. I couldn't outdo him, so why try? So instead, I just wait and waited for the storm to end like a tornado that passes. Pick up the pieces and you go on. He has come a very long way in the 38 years. I can tell when he's getting to a point of anger now. When this happens, I can either wait it out, depending on the situation, or sometimes all I have to do is really look at him to make him focus and say something to gentle him or touch him. We can read each other very well. I watch him. I don't do things to irritate him on purpose, ladies. You know what I'm talking about. I don't care if the toilet lid is up. It takes two seconds to put it down. Put it down without arguing. I don't care if he leaves a cabinet door open, which he does a lot. I just shut it. Okay, you know the things that irritate your husband, so why do them? You really don't want your husbands to be the kind of husband that society is pretending them to be. Wimps. Can you? I don't see any women shaking their heads. You think about it. We, us women, are doing this to our men. Maybe not so much in this church, but the entire world is doing that. I want a man. Amen? Okay, come on, ladies. Let's hear something. I w <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> I want a man, and I want to treat him like a man, not some cowering wimp that runs and hides every time I enter the room or say something. I don't know if you know anybody like that, but I've seen it lots of times. We don't want to do that to our men. I can be a helpmate. Um, by assisting him with tasks. As an example, in the garage, Ralph's in the garage a lot. So if I want to see him, a lot of times I'll just go out to the garage. And he'll say, hey, can you hand me this or that? Okay, mm what's it look like? But I help. Don't care anything about it, but I help. Uh, encourage him when things get tough. Give him time to rest and relax, ladies. This means your to-do list that you have Try not to make it so large. They have busy lives too, things on their minds, in their hearts, and they need rest. They really do. Um, oh, this one's going to be a good one for you ladies. We need to fulfill his sexual needs. I said that out loud. This is true. I'm not going to go into any more. I'll turn redder than a, anyway. And lastly, Pray for him. Pray, pray, pray each and every day. The benefit of that will come back to you a thousandfold. To be, to me, being his helpmate is to actually get him that cup of coffee. I like knowing that pleases my man. Some women now, when you see a response where maybe Ralph asked me, can you give me a cup of coffee? Okay. I'll go get it. And you'll look across the room and you see him just staring you down. You know, that, that pleases him. I want to please him. When this happens, he actually winds up bringing me my tea or coffee more so than I do for him. We try to outdo each other without knowing we're trying to do that. I treat him like my husband and we're best friends. I want to be with him. If he upsets me, I actually stop and think before I speak. I don't know if that's a wise quote or not, but ladies, please do that. You'll find you'll, you'll stop an argument before it starts. Just stop and think before you talk. And is it really worth it 
to fuel the fire. And I really do go back to an old saying, what would Jesus do or have me do in this situation? I didn't want to come and, and uh, beat you up, but after I see a lot of women in situations, if you just do some very simple things, your husband will pay you back in ways you'll never imagine. Happy Mother's Day, and men, it is about us today. If you've been around Diana and I very long, you realize how much we enjoy family, how much we enjoy marriage. Um, apart from salvation, marriage is, I think, the greatest thing God has ever given us. Uh, he instituted it all the way back in the Garden of Eden. And uh, we have been married 38 years. It just blows my mind when I think about that, when I think about the time that we've had together. Uh, we've known each other for 40 years. And uh, I just, I'm amazed that God would put somebody in my life like that. One of the things that she said that stood out to me was um, she learned me. She watched me, learned me. Um, I remember her, and I didn't know this when it happened at the time. She told me this later. But I remember when we were, dealing with a lot of those difficult times early on in our marriage, um, first seven to ten years weren't easy. Uh, and that was 90% my problem because, as she said, I had a very, very volatile temper. And I was very selfish. And she went to mom, and she made up her mind, this marriage is going to work. And she asked my mom, the older ladies and younger ladies, listen to me. She asked my mom, teach me how to love my husband. My dad was a difficult man at times, and mom displayed that with class. And so no better person could she have gone to to ask that advice. And one of the things that I would love to see our church engage in more is the Titus woman mentality and process. For our younger women, our young mothers, young wives, can search out older women and ask those type of questions. How do I love my husband? How do I raise my babies? This is... immensely valuable in the structure of the family. Daughter-in-laws, reach out to your mother-in-laws. Daughters, reach out to your mothers. Learn from them. Grandmas have so much to offer. If you'll just go and sit down and talk to them, let them teach you. Let them share with you their experience. It's true, we mellow with age, and experience is a great teacher, and you learn a lot as you go down the road. Tap into that experience, that life. Okay, enough said, we're going to get busy here. Now, I do need to ask you to do me a favor this morning. I'm feeling a little overly sensitive this morning. So I want you to be nice to me throughout the rest of the day. I got up this morning, took a shower, opened the cabinet door. I was out of deodorant. So I had to put Diana's deodorant on. <laughs> and it's just making me feel a little sensitive. Now, it's strong enough for a man, but it's made for a woman. So, be nice. All right, what do you do when things get out of whack? And they do all the time, don't they? 
Ephesians chapter 5 verse 33 says, However, let each of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. The subject that I want to talk to you guys about today is one that will never be embraced by the world. Anytime you speak about biblical roles within a family unit, criticism and reaction are sure to follow. So on your outline, immediately out of the gate this morning, I want to say this. The world hates the truth. And sadly, far too many people, even within the church, have been influenced by and have even embraced the standards of the world. Yesterday, the men came together and we watched a Tony Evans video and he talked about alignment. And it was a very powerful message and as I sat there and listened to that message, I thought, you know, I bet Tony gets a lot of, of emails and criticism about his position on the family. But God is the head of Christ, the Bible tells us. Christ is the head of the man. The man is the head of the woman. That's a tough position. That's a tough doctrinal position to teach in the culture and the society in which we live in today. But it's still true. Satan is the father of lies. Jesus identifies him as an accuser as well as a liar. And in the area in which his lies seem to be the most effective in our society is within the family unit. Men are believing lies. Women are believing lies. They're, they're adapting to, to worldly ideals that, about how a family is supposed to be structured. What does a family look like? A family can be all types of things. No, it cannot. A family is a man, a woman, married, bringing forth godly offspring. But the world is blind to that truth. 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 4 says, In their case, the God of this world, which is Satan, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Now, there's a blindness. We live in a culture that simply cannot see the truth. They can't, they can't understand it because they are being hindered. A culture that is in complete disarray because it's abandoned the one very important rule of any healthy society. And it's a rule that God himself instituted in the very beginning when he created man and woman. You see, God designed marriage to be between, as I said, one man, one woman. That union was to bring godly offspring, to create a family unit where there is a father, where there is a mother, and there are children. Now, within that union, God created men to lead and women, to, as Diana has already spoken to, to serve as a helpmate to her husband, to that man. Now, let me say this right now. Listen to me, ladies, carefully. That in no way, in no way diminishes the role or the value of you as a woman. That is the lie that many women are believing that, well, then that diminishes my role. That makes me less. That is not true. Not true at all. Even though the husband is the head of that household, he is designed, created, and built in such a way as to lead that household, he does it as he serves that household. You see, Jesus said, I didn't come to serve, or I didn't come to be served, but I came to serve. The imagery for the husband is that you and I, as men, are to serve our women. We are to serve 
our children. We are to serve the household structure. Maintaining oversight and leadership, but, but a good leader is a servant leader. A good leader is a loving leader. A good leader is one that looks to the benefit and the welfare of those in which he is in charge of, those in which he is held accountable for. That's the mark of a good leader. It's not someone who lords it over them. It's not someone who is, is hard, someone who is abrasive. It's one who knows how to lead and lead lovingly. It's one that knows how to get his family to follow because they sense that protection and that covering that only he can provide them. This is the natural order of a family. You can argue it all you want. You can debate it all you want, but it is the natural order of the family. There's no other plan that works as effectively for the family. Although society is working to, di to diminish the family and to redefine the family as what family can be, it is the only plan that's effective. Now, before those of you who would reject this truth start checking out on me, I want you to realize that what I'm saying is a biblical mandate. So if, you're, if you have issue with this, your issue is with God's word. It's not with me. Let's look at what Scripture says. Genesis 2.18, And the Lord God said, It's not good that man should be alone. I'll make for him a helper fit for him, one that perfectly fits him emotionally, spiritually, physically, sexually, in every way. It's a perfect fit on every level. Right here, we begin to see that God intended from the beginning that men and women should share equal responsibilities within the family. Do you hear what I just said? Men and women share equal responsibilities within the family. Not the same role, but equal value. And here's where we begin to get into trouble is, is defining the role of the husband, defining the role of the, of the wife. In Genesis 3, 16 and 17, look at what the Lord says. This happened after the fall, after they had rejected God and they had turned and, and they had chosen to go their own way. To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain, look at those two words. In pain, you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. To Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and you have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. And look at this. Again, those two words. In pain, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. We've created tension. Because of our sin nature, there is a natural tension that exists between men and women. And we, be, we begin to argue over things that, that we shouldn't be arguing over. We, we attend to, or attempt to assume positions and roles within the family that, that aren't ours to take on. In Ephesians chapter 5, verses 21 through 25, it begins like this. And this is where a lot of guys, a lot of pastors want to begin with this verse in chapter 22 and start there. But you need to back up and look at 21 before you look at 22. Look at what it says. It says, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, now he begins to address the individual. This is what I do when I'm doing a wedding ceremony for a couple, when we're working through the vows. There's a place where I come to that I speak to first the man. Then I turn and I speak to the woman. And then I speak to them both. What Paul has done here is he speaks to them both, submit to one another. And then he turns and he speaks to the woman first. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband's the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and he is he himself its Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, 
love your wives. As Christ loved the church and gave his life for the church. In 1 Peter chapter 3, Peter picks this up and he begins to speak in this way. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands so, as, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. And when they see your respectful and pure, and pure conduct, do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing that you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is in God's sight is very precious." But this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children if you, do, if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel since they are heirs with you of the grace of life so that your prayers may not be hindered. Go to your outline, guys. When husbands and wives begin to see their roles, look at this, because this is what we've been talking about in the last, these last two passages of Scripture. When husbands and wives begin to see their roles as reflections of the relationship between Jesus and the church, his church, the family always benefits. It always benefits. It does flourishes. But when we oppose or impose our will over Christ's will, everything begins to start becoming chaotic. Tony Evans said, everything gets out of alignment. He used the illustration of a front end on a car shimmying and shaking and taking it into the shop and they checked it and they said, well, the alignment is, is out on the car, which caused the whole car to be affected. And he used this illustration and I thought it was really good in that when we get God's plan out of alignment, God the Father, Christ, husband, wife, when we get this out of alignment, it affects every part of the family, not only the family, but it also affects our society. And we're seeing and living through the effects of that right now. The world attempts to paint men as idiots. And, you know, and what frustrates me is that sometimes men fit the role really well. They, I hate watching these sitcoms where men are made to look stupid. You know, it's just like, okay, enough's enough. Because there's this, it's like this undercurrent, you know, that men aren't smart enough to get in out of the rain unless somebody tells them to. But sometimes when you look at men and you see the passiveness that they tend to display, you kind of find yourself agreeing with that just a little bit. On the other hand, the, the society and our culture is, is working overtime to try to convince women that they need to fight to establish their strength towards men, which is exactly what God said would happen back in Genesis chapter 3, verse 16. Take a look at this. It says, your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you, or he, or, but he shall rule over you. Now, that passage means this. Because this is all falling in line with the curses that, that came about through, through our sin. What he's saying here is he says, ladies, you're going to have the tendency to want that position, to want that authority within the family unit. You're going to, and you've already started displaying it, you're going to want to start telling Adam how life's going to be, the way things are going to work, what we're going to do, what we're not going to do where we're going to go, where we're not going to go. You're going to want that. You're going to start trying to take that away from him. You're going to try to lead. It's a natural, normal tendency to want to step up and to lead. Ladies, let me give you some advice. Resist that. 
resist that. And that's becoming more and more important because our society and our culture is emasculating our boys. They're confusing them. They're, they're failing to, to allow them to be boys. They're, they're, they're trying to take all of that aggression out of them. They're trying to, to shape them and mold them into girls basically, to try to, to establish and to create um, equal roles here. And so you have, we've got to resist this. Let your boys be boys. Teach your girls to be girls. Help them to see this, this design that God has for them. Women are uniquely made. It's an amazing creation. And when, when a woman begins to really start to embrace how she's wired, and, and a lot of women don't even understand their own makeup and how God has put them together and, 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 and built them. And when they do, it's an amazing thing to watch that woman just blossom. And when a man begins to start to learn how to curb that aggression as he gets older, as he becomes a young man, when he learns how to start being able to rein that in and, and, and realize this is the way God has made me, this is why he's made me this way, it's amazing to watch that young boy turn into that, that, that strong young man that, that is capable of leading, that, that knows how to love and knows how to serve. It's just an amazing thing to let God's plan walk itself out. Now, Peter, in this passage, and some of you ladies might be hung up on this, Peter in this passage referred to you as a weaker vessel. And I've been in situations where women look at that and go, I don't like that. Well, that's because you don't understand what he's talking about here. You see, when Peter is talking about women being a weaker vessel, this has nothing to do with your character, with your intellect, uh, with your spirituality, um, None of that. What he's talking about is, again, a natural process that happens with men. He's referring to the fact that men, typically because most men are stronger physically, they're by nature wired to be more aggressive. They will have that tendency to be abusive, not just physically, but emotionally uh, and and sometimes even spiritually. Now, this was where I failed early on in my marriage. I had aggression. I learned how to manipulate situations to my benefit with my anger. I could control situations. I used it as a tool. And Diana, she suffered the brunt of that because when I wanted what I wanted, I made sure I got it. I use that inappropriately. The aggression is a part of being a man. It, it's it's, that, it's that, that thing that causes men to, without any thought, run right into a burning building and rescue a total stranger without even giving any thought. It's why men are so aggressive in battle. It's why boys fight on the playground over something silly like a baseball game or something. It's... It's just the way they are. It's, they're, they're wired that way. But it was out of control. I didn't have it reined in. And so what happens is that if we don't learn how as men to come under the leadership of the Lord and learn how to, to, to bring that under control, men will have a tendency to abuse women. And we're being warned here by Peter, honor them. Honor them and love them. There's also an element that needs to be considered here as well that we men need to be very sensitive to. Go to your outline. Decisions that women make tend to be more emotionally charged than a man's, which can for them expose more vulnerability. And we are often insensitive to this as men. I guarantee you, if we took the time to sit down and talk about this and women were able to be honest, they would say that, yeah, a lot of times my husband isn't sensitive to what I'm feeling and what, what I think. Your decisions tend to be more emotionally charged. Men, you will do yourself 
a great service if you will learn how important that is to you as a man. Because our decisions aren't always emotionally charged. We have a tendency as a rule to be a lot more black and white. It either is or it isn't. What's the problem? Am I right? Don't you shake your head, no, Paul Jones, you liar. But let me emphasize, ladies, weakness, the, 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 the weaker vessel here, again, has nothing to do with your intelligence, has nothing to do with your character. It just has to do with the physical element that exists and how men will tend to use that against you. Their aggression, their size, all of that stuff, they will have a tendency to use that. That's why so many women are abused, is men violate that. When it comes to character, when it comes to intellect, women are often stronger in this area than men. Yes, I just said it. In many situations, women are smarter than men. Y'all are scared, aren't you? Seriously. A lot of times, women are smarter than us intellectually, their IQs are higher. They grasp more information. And, and the reason is, is because women can, can process so much data at the same time. I mean, they can multitask like, like no other. Men, as a general rule, stink at multitasking. We can't process lots of information and lots of data. We have to process data, and when we've done with, with, with that issue or that subject or whatever, we stick it in a compartment, and we say, okay, next. What's the next thing? You know, we, we don't multitask. We talk about this a lot of times in coaching couples, is that women can, they can talk on the phone, cook supper, carry a baby on their hip, and help a child with homework all at the same time. I can... Maybe do one of those at a time. You know, we talk about calling your husband at work and telling him to stop at the store and pick stuff up on his way home. Ladies, that's the dumbest thing in the world you could do to us. Seriously? Number one, if we're at work, don't call us because we don't want to talk to you. And the reason is it's not because we don't love you and it's not, not because we just, we can't get that. We are in our work box at that time. We are thinking about what we're doing. Don't call us and say, oh, honey, would you stop by the store? And we need some bacon and eggs and, and we also need some ice cream and be, sure, and, and be sure to pick up some toilet paper and I don't like the scratchy kind. You know which kind I like. You know, and, and so you're giving us this list, and we're like, are you serious here? You know, and we stop at the store, and we pick up maybe three of the five or seven items that you just rattled off, and you don't understand why we forgot stuff. It's because we aren't capable of remembering all of it. We can't process all that information. Women are oftentimes smarter. They can cover more ground. They... You know, women as a rule are more motivated than men. Now, that ought to get amen out of you women, right? Women are oftentimes far more motivated than men. And you're able to, that drives you. I don't know where sometimes women get their energy. Watching you guys sometimes exhausts me. It's like, man, I got to sit down and rest for you, honey. So I go get in a recliner, you know, and sit down. And I'm saying, somebody needs to rest here, honey. So the way you're going, I need a break. I mean, it's crazy what you guys can pull off. And, you know, so guys, understand, they're not men. I don't want them to be. They are emotionally charged most of the time. 
which is just a part of their makeup. But it's, it's, it's vital. This is vital to the family because we're not. So we need that in our lives. I need Diana. Did you hear what she said? She says, sometimes when I know that Ralph's starting to get irritated or he's starting to get a little aggravated about something and, and his anger is starting to build a little bit, she can just touch me or she can just look at me. And when I see that, I start to, to relax. I start to focus. And I'll throttle back. And sometimes it's just, it, it's, she never says anything. But she reminds me, pull this back. We went down this road one day. We, we don't go down that road anymore. I need that in my life. I need her to be sensitive to things because God has given her a spirituality and a discernment that I don't have. I'm never going to have it. Men, you're never going to have it. It's, women only have it. And it's a special gift. It's unique. And you need it. Don't get frustrated at your wife because she says something that you might, your first reaction is like, that's stupid. Or what would make you think that way? You catch that. Because maybe what she's saying at that time, in reality, might not make any sense to the circumstance or the situation. But more often than not, you need her in your ear pulling you back because you are wired to be aggressive. You're wired to move. You're wired to get done what needs to be done. And you need that. Come on, hon. Whoa, 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 whoa. Think about this. Don't go in there and kill our child. I know they deserve a beating. But get a grip first. We have to have that in our lives, guys. And don't don't feel like it's an insult or that you're less of a man if your wife is smarter than you. Celebrate that. Celebrate it. That she's able to do things you're not able to do. Maybe she can keep the bills better. Maybe she can balance a checkbook. Maybe she can do this. or do. Man, celebrate that for crying out loud. Don't be threatened by that. I've had men, and the reason I'm saying this is because I've had men talk to me about a wife is smarter than I am, man. She's just, she's just so smart. Good. What's wrong with that? There's a story today that I want to bring to you, and I'm always wanting to pull just one thing out of this story. I, I won't have time to read through the whole story. It's in 1 Kings chapter 21. If you want to read that on your own time, it's about Ahab and Jezebel. But I just, I just want to read a, a piece of it. I'll share a little bit of the story because I just want to pull one thing out of it for you ladies, just to help you, uh, as what Diana was talking about, just to help you guard against something. In 1 Kings 21, 25, it says, there was, there was none who sold himself to do what was evil in the sight of the Lord like Ahab, whom Jezebel, his wife, incited. Now, I want to introduce you to these Old Testament couple, or this Old Testament couple uh, that displays what happens in a lot of marriages that we see today. But I want to make something abundantly clear, first of all. Ahab and Jezebel were evil people. They were evil to the core. That's not the case in most marriages. The vast majority of marriages, the vast majority of marriages are made up of two good intentioned people that have tendencies to sometimes believe lies. And they let those lies destroy their marriage. But most marriages, I, Diana and I have never met with bad people when we've been coaching and working with people in their marriages. Good intentions on your outline, guys. Good intention people sometimes display bad behavior. They don't set out to do bad things. Husbands don't set out to, to, 
to, to do bad things. Wives don't set out to do bad things. They simply act out on impulse. Most of us act on impulse. Something said, something's done, boom, we react. It's an impulse. We just, the way we do things. And oftentimes, here's the tragedy, oftentimes it's when we act on impulse, we don't realize what it's doing to our circumstances. We don't realize the effect that it's having on our marriage relationship. This is more true with men than women, but I've seen it both ways. Oftentimes, women can, can be doing things, and this is why I want to talk about this this morning, is sometimes you can be doing things, and you don't even know that you're doing them. You're not even aware that you're doing them, but you are, and it's, it's hurting. It's, it's, it's being detrimental to your relationship with your husband. You're, you're throttling him back to the point that you're not getting the man you really want. Ahab had been king of Israel for 20 years. Ahab was a great military man. He was a great strategist. Ahab was a strong leader in every arena of his life, except one. You know where that was? At home. At home. When he came home to the palace, he was no longer in charge. He was no longer the leader. Jezebel was. He became this strong military leader, this strong strategist, this, this strong man became passive when he walked through the door of his home. Some of you men that are sitting here right now might be feeling a little uncomfortable because you're sitting there saying to yourself, I can relate to that man. You see, when you're at work with the guys, man, you're able to act and be exactly what God created you to be and designed you to be, a man. But when you come home, all the rules change. When you're at work, man, you can strategize, you can plan, you... You're respected by the other men that you're around all the time. But you come home and something's changing. Something is different. And most of you can't put your finger on it. You don't know exactly what it is. But the rules change. And that is because men typically don't know how to fight with women. We don't know how. It's just, we, so we don't know how to fix this. We don't know how to change this, especially if, if, if a woman has a little bit of a strong, aggressive tendency herself. We don't know what to do with that. I have had men, and this is sad, but I've had men tell me, I'd rather be at work than at home. I'd rather be at work than at home. And that's because they get that respect. They feel more like a man in that environment than they do when they come home. Ladies, if your husbands could feel safe enough to, to tell you this, I bet you some of them might tell you I'm right on the money. They, would, they might say, I would rather be at work. And it's not that they don't love you. It, it, please don't think that. It's not that they don't love you. It's just that there's something that men desperately need. They need it like air, and that's respect. They need that respect. And they need it from you more than they need it from their coworkers, more than they need it from anybody else. And when you were courting each other, when you were dating, they were getting it. But something happens when people get married and children start coming and life starts taking off. Sometimes unintentionally, you quit. No longer does he feel like that man that he felt like when you were dating before you got married.
I've always worried a little bit when I hear men say, I say something to them, I ask them about something, and their first response, first response is, I got to check with my wife first. Now, let me say this first so you ladies don't flip out. I can't help but wonder why, though. I always, my mind always goes to that. Why, why, why do you have to do that? What's the motivation? Go to your outline so that nobody jumps me at the door when they're walking out. If a husband truly loves his wife as himself, he will understand the importance of her involvement in his life, and he will want to want. He will want to be considerate. I started to change that. He will want to be considerate of her input. So if a man is saying that I need to check with my wife because he truly wants to know how's this going to play into my decision here, I want to make sure I'm not doing something that's going to be detrimental to our family, something's not scheduled or something of that nature. Yes, I want that input. I want that advice, that counsel. Again, let's go back to the fact she might be smarter than you in certain things and she might be aware of things that you are not aware of. If that's the case, man, exactly, you should. I use Diana's counsel all the time. I'll call her into my office when I'm at home working and stuff. I say, hey, come here, come here, come here, come here. So she comes in and she goes, what? And I say, I got to run something by you. And I'll, I'll ask her. I'll talk to her about it. And sometimes I'll have her sit down and, and we'll beat stuff back and forth. And sometimes when we're in the vehicle going somewhere and we're driving, I'll say, hey, hey, what, what? think about this. I want to run this by you and bounce this off of you, you know, and stuff. Because it affects us and we're working together. And I want that counsel. I want that advice in my life and stuff. But if a man can't make a decision because he's fearful of backlash that he might end up getting, Something is desperately wrong in that household. If that man can't make a decision because he's afraid he's going to pay for it when he gets home, something ain't right there. Something is way out of balance. Let's pick the story back up. Ahab spoke to Nabal, or Naboth, saying, Give me your vineyard so that Give me your vineyard that I may have it for a vegetable garden because it's close beside my house and I will give you a better vineyard than it's in its place. And if you like, I'll give you the price of, of it in money. And David said to Ahab, he said, man, Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance of my father. In other words, his land had been given to him. It had been handed down to him by his father and possibly grandfather and had been in the family and all for who knows how long. And so he said, I can't sell this ground. This, is, no, this, is, this belongs to my family. It's, a, it's an inheritance. Well, Ahab, the king of Israel, came into his own house, sullen and vexed because of the word which Naboth, had, the Jeze, uh, Jezreelite, had spoken to him. For he said, I will not give you the inheritance of my father. And he lay down on his bed, and he turned away his face, and he ate no food. Now, ladies, this is a perfect example of your husband acting like a baby. I mean, this guy goes home and pouts. And I know, I know us men, we have a tendency to pout. Diana could probably come back up on the stage and say, yeah, let me tell you about this time and this other th situation and, and all. We do have a tendency to pout. And that's just part of how we're made and sometimes you guys have to deal with that. But what happens later in this story, if we had time to go on and read it, is that Jezebel handles this incorrectly she criticizes him and that's what I want to talk about is this criticism go to your outline when a woman criticizes or fails to encourage her husband she weakens him ladies you can't believe the power you have over us when you criticize your husband you weaken him Jezebel begins to criticize him because he's passive. That's not, you're not going to build the confidence of a passive man by criticizing him. It's just not going to happen. I have heard so many women say that they wish their husband would step up and lead their home. Man, I just wish he would just step up and be the leader. I, I hear this a lot. But ladies, a lot of men don't feel safe to lead their home. Because it's possible you might be making that tough for them. You're not stepping in alignment with them and encouraging them to lead in a proper manner. 
You just criticize. When he does make a decision, when he does take a leadership role, you find something wrong with it. No, that's not right. No, you just can't do that stuff. You got to be careful. How do you talk to him? How do you communicate? And what did Diana say? Learn your husband. Diana knows when to come and when to approach me, when to talk with me. We've talked about all this. She has permission to speak into my life, and I don't take offense to it because I know she doesn't have any ill intent towards me. She's not criticizing me. But, she, but we had to talk that out. We had to give each other permission for us to speak into each other's lives, taking into consideration how each of us are wired, how we are built. And it's, if you guys hung around us and was around us all the time, some of you might think, listen to how they talk to each other. You know, listen to the, some of the stuff they say to each other. And then they laugh about each other. They laugh at each other and stuff. It's because we've learned each other. And we both know neither one of us have any ill intent towards, towards each other. Your words are crazy powerful. A woman's words can accomplish so much. And they can do more damage than the words of any man. Let me just give you a few examples. The words of a woman have a unique ability to calm the fears of a frightened child. There's something about mama that daddy ain't got. The words of a woman have a unique ability to encourage a child to do things that even the child believes is to be impossible. The words of a woman can motivate a man to do more than he ever thought he could do. The words of a woman can elevate a man's confidence farther than it's ever been in his life. The words of a woman can strengthen a weak man or break the confidence of a strong man. And here's a sad statement. The words of a woman can convince a man to leave his wife and his family. Words of a woman are powerful. Very, very powerful. And if you only knew the impact that you have on your men to build them up or to tear them down, oh, ladies, you would do yourself so much good if you would learn your man and learn how to speak to him using those words to build him up. You'd have a man that would do anything in the world for you. Most women believe that they can criticize their men to make them better. You want to know how men process complaining, ladies? It's on your outline. Men process complaining as contempt for who they are as a man. When you criticize his work, when you cr criticize something about him, he doesn't see it as constructive. He sees it as contempt. You don't respect me as a man. I don't measure up. It's a terrible thing to do to your husband, to your, to your man. See, men as a rule, we don't criticize each other. You say, oh, I mean, I've heard you guys talk to each other and stuff. You all insult each other all the time. Oh, yeah, we insult each other because that's what men do. You know, man, you're fat and ugly. That looks stupid on you. Thanks. Appreciate it. Now I know the guy likes me. You know, that's just the way we, we talk to each other. But men don't typically criticize each other. Usually if it's gotten to that point, fights already broke out. Men typically are, by nature, respectful of one another. You see, men would never say to each other some of the stuff you women say to us. Ain't no way. We get our faces punched. You know, we, we just don't do that. As a rule, 
We just don't do that. Here's what you need to hear, ladies. When a man has digested a steady diet of not being loved and respected, mostly being respected, when he has been digesting a steady diet of that, he will check out on you. He will check out on you. You know why? It goes back to what I said a while ago. We don't know how to fight with you. We know how to fight with each other. Men know how to fight with each other because we know what the rules are. And when the outcome is decided, we're good. We're back, we're back to buddies again, and we're okay. But we don't know how to do that with you girls because y'all don't fight fair. We don't know what to do, so we check out. I've already talked about this. Men cannot process, on your outline, men cannot process as much information as most women are able to communicate. So learn your man. Learn how he needs you to communicate with him. And this is not rocket science, ladies. All you got to do is just spend some time with him, listen to him, watch him, and know he's not going to communicate like me. And he doesn't want a lot of conversation. He doesn't want a lot of data. He does better with less data than more. Sometimes less is more. And that would be a great thing to, to, to learn. Well, Jezebel takes over. Her husband's not going to do nothing. So she steps up. She gets Naboth killed. And then she goes and tells her husband, now you go get that land. You're the king of Israel. Don't let nobody push you around. Go get the land. Ladies, you got to understand the value of allowing your husband and helping your husband lead. Maybe they do need to be motivated a little bit. As I've already said, women typically are more motivated than men. So sometimes your man needs some motivation. But be careful. Be careful as you try to motivate him. Learn him, but let him lead. And if he doesn't do something, if he doesn't make a decision, then you got to, like Diana said, sometimes you just got to block your jaw and say, okay, it's not worth it. This is not worth the relationship issue here. But know this, your husband's been created to lead. You need to just learn how to help, that, help draw that out if, if he's not by nature leading. Talk to him about it. When you don't learn this, ladies, husbands, you need to know this, husbands are leaving their families over stuff like this. They're walking out. He's got to feel respected, and he needs to know he's appreciated at home. Ahab let Jezebel take the lead role here. What's interesting is let's look, gentlemen, at how God reacted to this. 1 Kings 21, 17, 19, the Lord said to Elijah, Go down to meet King Ahab of Israel who rules in Samaria. He will be at Naboth's vineyard in Jezreel claiming it for himself. Give him this message. This is what the Lord says. Wasn't it enough that you killed Naboth? Hmm. Who killed Naboth? Jezebel. Who ordered the hit? Jezebel. Who gets blamed for it? Ahab. Okay, guys, this is rocket science. What, what's the, what do you think that means? What do you think the lesson here is? She made the decision. She took over the leadership role. She usurped her authority in a place she shouldn't have, and he did exactly what his forefather Adam did, stand there and do nothing. And God says, you're responsible. Look at your outline, guys. God will always hold the man responsible for the condition of his family. Ladies, not you, him. That's a tremendous responsibility for us men to have to bear, knowing that God is holding us accountable. If I'm going to be held accountable, I think I'm going to be in the driver's seat. 
If I'm going to be responsible for the wreck, I want my hands on the steering wheel. It only makes sense. It's abundantly clear in this story that Ahab failed. And God held Ahab responsible for the death of Naboth, not Jezebel. Ladies, if you've taken control of your household away from your husbands, give it back. Give it back. Get your family back in alignment again. See, once you dispel the lies that some women have conceived and convinced themselves that are true, and you really get down to your heart, I think you would agree with what Diana had to say this morning. I want a man's man. I want a real man. A man that will cover me. A man that will protect me. A man that will love me. A man that I can count on and depend on fight for me. When you start peeling the layers back of all of the damage that society has done to our women and you start getting down to the very core of their heart and when they get the opportunity to get a glimpse of a real man, they will tell you that's what I want. That's what I want. On your outline, most women yearn for a strong, loving leader in their man. And I can prove it in just a very simple manner. Ladies, how does it make you feel when your children go to your husband and ask him something and he says these words, go ask your mom? What does that do to you? Work and draw and fruit for food, and so you got to be kidding me. Now we laugh at that, but that's a telltale sign. That's not what our women want. Our women want us to lead. At the heart of a woman. That's what she desires. Guys, if your answer to that question is, let me talk to your mom. I'll get back to you. Three things happen to your, to your woman. Mom's input, number one, is valued and she's honored as a helpmate. Number two, dad proves that he's willing to lead and accept responsibility for doing so. And number three, your kids are trained as to how home should function in obedience to God's word. They see it. And they reap the benefits of it. Ladies, you may have to redirect your children right back to their daddy from time to time. Say, I don't care what he said. You go ask him. He'll, he'll get it. He, he might be a little duller than you are, but he'll start to sharpen up and realize, well, it ain't going to do no good to send him to mama. I might as well do something here. You got so much power. Like I said, ladies, you're only weak when it comes to the physical structure between you and your husband, unless you can beat him up, which is not typical. But in every other way, you're an amazing person. You're an amazing creation. And you, your role is not less. It is equal to. It's just not the same. It's just not the same. Don't resist your role. Don't believe the lies of the world and the culture. Embrace it. Embrace it because you truly are 
a unique and special creation. Here's your takeaway. Trust God and his plan and enjoy the benefits of doing marriage the way God intended it to be. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for the institution of marriage. Forgive us as a society and culture of, of trying to diminish it, trying to redefine it. Family is what you intend it to be. The roles of men and women are what you've intended them to be. If we would just simply obey, if we would simply surrender, oh, how great life can be, even in the midst of chaos, even in a world of lies. Help us to embrace your plan. Help us to trust you in it. As Peter spoke to women, be not frightened of this. Do not be fearful of this. Embrace it. Thank you for the women that you have placed in our lives for how they complete us because there is not a man alive that is complete without that woman in his life. She balances, she brings us that, that connection. She enables us to be a true reflection of the image in which we were created. Thank you, Jesus. pray this in your name. Amen. It's always something that I want